I'm going to read from Alfred North Whitehead's book, Adventures of Ideas, uh, that was published in um, 1933. On page 41, Whitehead writes, Science is founded on the notion of law, the laws of nature. The notion is that there are many things in the world whose behavior towards each other always exemplifies fixed rules. These rules are evidently indicating recurrences which never fail to recur. Yet here a perplexity arises as to the connection of the laws with the behaving things. Behaviors differ widely in a city, New York for instance, in a forest, in a subtropical desert, in an arctic ice field. Also, to travel further, they differ widely on the moon, on the atmosphere of the sun, in the interior of a dense star, in interstellar space. But this is very superficial. We all know that if we analyze the things into molecules, the laws of chemistry are the same in the city, the forest, the desert, and the ice field. These laws of chemistry express the mutual behavior of molecules packed with sufficient closeness. But molecules are analyzable. Things behave very differently amid a close pack of molecules from their behavior amid the vibrations of so-called empty space. The chemical laws are merely relevant to the interrelations of molecules. In empty space, we are driven back to the fundamental electromagnetic laws controlling the flux of energy. At this point, we have to stop our regression, merely because our penetration has come to an end. But there is no reason to doubt that the laws are the outcome of the environment of electromagnetic occasions. This whole process of regression suggests an inversion of ideas. The laws are the outcome of the character of the behaving things. They are the communal customs of which St. Clement spoke. This, conceptions should, this conception should replace the older idea of given things with mutual behavior conditioned by imposed laws. What we know of external nature is wholly in terms of how the various occasions in nature contribute to each other's natures. The whole environment participates in the nature of each of its occasions. Thus, each occasion takes its initial form from the character of its environment. Also, the laws which condition each environment merely express the general character of the occasions composing that environment. This is the doctrine of the definition of things in terms of their modes of functioning. But we are now drawing close to the impracticable ethics of Christianity. The ideals cherished in the souls of men enter into the character of their actions. These interactions within society modify the social laws by modifying the occasions to which those laws apply. Impracticable ideas are a program for reform. Such a program is not to be criticized by immediate possibilities. Progress consists in modifying the laws of nature so that the republic on earth may conform to that society to be discerned ideally by the divination of wisdom. In these two chapters, I'm beginning on chapter uh, three, we have been considering the adventures in the history of Europe of a great idea. Plato conceived the notion of the ideal relations between men based upon a conception of the intrinsic possibilities of human character. We see this idea enter into human consciousness in every variety of specialization. It forms alliances with allied notions generated by, relig by religion. It differentiates its specializations according to the differentiations 
of the diverse religions and diverse skepticisms associated with it. At times it dies down, but it ever recurs. It is criticized, and it is also a critic. Force is always against it. Its victory is the victory of persuasion over force. The force is the sheer fact of what the antecedent volume of the world in fact contains. The idea is a prophecy which procures its own fulfillment. The power of an ideal consists in this. When we examine the general world of a current fact, we find that its general character, practically inescapable, is neutral in respect to the realization of intrinsic value. The electromagnetic occasions and the electromagnetic laws, the molecular occasions and the molecular laws, are all alike neutral. They condition the sort of values which are possible, but they do not determine the specialities of value. When we examine the specializations of societies which determine values with some particularity, such specializations as societies of men, forests, deserts, prairies, ice fields, we find, within limits, plasticity. The story of Plato's idea of persuasion over force is the story of its energizing within a local plastic environment. It has a creative power, making possible its own approach to realization. The cultural history of Western civilization for the period illuminated by written records can be considered from many aspects. It can be conceived under the guise of a steady economic progression, diversified by catastrophic collapses to lower levels. Such a point of view emphasizes technology and economic organization. Alternatively, history can be conceived as a series of oscillations between worldliness and otherworldliness, or as a theater of contest between greed and virtue, or between, between truth and error. Such points of view emphasize religion, morality, and contemplative habits eliciting generalizations of thought. Each mode of consideration is a sort of searchlight elucidating some of the facts and retreating the remainder into an omitted background. Of course, in any history, even with a restricted topic, limited to politics or to art or to science, many points of view are in fact interwoven, each with varying grades of generality. One of the most general philosophical notions to be used in the analysis of civilized activities is to consider the effect on social life due to the variations of emphasis between individual absoluteness and individual relativity. Here, absoluteness means the notion of release from essential dependence on other members of the community in respect to modes of activity while relativity means the converse fact of essential relatedness. In one of their particularizations, these ideas appear in the antagonism between notions of freedom and of social organization. In another, they appear in the relative importance to be ascribed to the welfare of the state and to the welfare of its individual members. The character of each epoch as to its social institutions, its jurisprudence, its notions of ideal ends within the range of practicability, depends largely upon those various patches of activity within which one or other of these notions, individual ab absoluteness or individual relativity, is dominant for that epoch. No period is wholly controlled by either one of these extremes, reigning through its whole range of activities. Repression in one direction is balanced by freedom in others. Military discipline is severe. In the last resort, individual soldiers are sacrificed to the army. But in many fields of human activity, soldiers are left completely unfettered, both by regulation and by custom. For members of university faculties, the repressions and the freedoms are very different from those which obtain for soldiers. 
distribution of emphasis between absoluteness and relativity is seemingly arbitrary. Of course, there is always a historical reason for the pattern. Frequently, the shifting of emphasis is to be ascribed to the general tendency to revolt from the immediate past, to interchange black and white wherever, wherever we find them. Also, the transformation may be a judgment upon dogmas held responsible for inherited failures. It should be one function of history to disengage such a judgment from the irritation due to transient circumstances. More often, changes in the social pattern of intellectual emphasis arise from a shift of power from, one's cla from one class or group of classes to another class or group of classes. For example, an oligarchic aristocratic government and a democratic government may each tend to emphasize social organization, that is to say, the relativity of individuals to the state. But governments mainly satisfying the trading and professional classes, whether nominally they be aristocratic, democratic, or absolute, emphasize personal freedom, that is to say, individual absoluteness. Governments of the latter kind have been that of imperial Rome, with its middle-class imperial agents, and its middle-class stoic lawyers, and, its, and in its happiest period, its middle-class emperors, and that of England in the 18th and 19th centuries. With the shift of dominant classes, points of view which in one epoch are submerged, only to be detected by an occasional ripple, later emerge into the foreground of action and literary expression,